Good morning, Living Hope. Let's stand as we open up. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. Come, let us worship our King. Some exterior doors, so if you've seen some of our doors, they need painted. 
Um, adding some bushes along the west side of the church. And hopefully they'll maybe pull out some bushes and everything. So October 8th, work day here at church starting at 8 o'clock. And the last thing is life groups tonight. Uh, we are inviting you to our place for life groups. So just ask that you bring your lawn chairs and snacks. So hopefully see a lot of you tonight at our place. Thanks. Thanks, Gar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, just a couple other announcements, uh, some different things going on. Uh, most of you are probably aware that uh, Denzel's mother, Ruby Kane, passed away uh, this last week. And so we want to remember Denzel and his family in our prayers. Um, services are going to take place tomorrow. Uh, there's a visitation from 10 to 11.45 and then the funeral at noon. And those will all take place at the funeral home in Delaware. So uh, 1045, 10 to 11.45 is visitation, and then the uh, services at noon for Ruby Kane. So we want to remember Denzel's family in our prayers. Uh, just a couple other things that are going on this week. Dar mentioned life group tonight at the Beachy's house. Uh, the 2011 youth group will meet at 3 p.m. over here at the Parsonage. That's for all of our youth ages uh, 6th grade through senior in high school. Uh, everyone's welcome to come. Uh, Monday evening, 6.45, the women's book group will meet here at church, and uh, Tuesday morning, 6 a.m., men's Bible study here, here in, uh, in our fellowship hall as well. All guys are invited to join us for that. Um, you'll notice an uh, announcement about the relief sale in your bulletin. Be sure and, uh, be sure and read that. There's been a little bit of a change as to, as to how it's going to take place this year as opposed to how it's been done in the past. Also, along with that, the Illinois Mennonite Relief Sale Board will be hosting a sausage fundraiser. Both bulk and link sausage will be available. Ordering information will be available next week, and orders will be taken through October 16th. So if you're interested in eating some of that good sausage from the relief sale, uh, next week you can place orders for that. If you have any questions about that, uh, you can see Beth Beach. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started our worship time this morning. Father in heaven, it is good for us to find ourselves before your throne. Thank you for each person that has come to worship you today, to give of themselves, to honor you, to bring glory before your throne. We thank you for those that are joining us on Facebook Live as well. Um, Father, just, just bless each one that, uh, that is honoring you today with their presence. Father, we love you, and you know it's our deepest desire to serve you each and every day in whatever way that might look for, for all of us. Lord, we know that, that your Holy Spirit has given those that follow you, each one has received a gift of your Spirit. And Father, we, we want to use those gifts in your service. Give us, uh, give us that desire, uh, give us that, that prodding that we need to, to step out and, and to, to serve you, to serve your people, to serve uh, your community, uh, to serve this world in whatever way that, that we can find to do that. Father, we lift up uh, concerns, uh, those things that are heavy on our hearts today, and especially now we think of the family of Ruby Kane, Denzel's mother. Um, Father, just walk with that family uh, during these days. We thank you for Ruby's life and for what she meant to her family and, and her friends. And, and Father, as uh, services take place tomorrow, we pray that, uh, that family and friends would, would feel your love, would feel your comfort, uh, would feel the care that only you can provide uh, during this time of sorrow. Uh, so, Father, bless this family uh, as they walk this path. Uh, Lord, we pray for uh, pray for those that are that are on our hearts uh, continually during these days. We think of Arliss and Linda. We think of Joyce Thrasher. Uh, we think of others, Joe and Jenny Oswald. Uh, Father, ones that are near and dear to us that. Are struggling in, in different ways. 
just be close to them, provide for them what they need uh, to get through each day. Let them know that, uh, that their church family is thinking about them and, and praying for them, lifting them up before your throne. And Father, I know that all of us come today with different things in our hearts and minds, uh, unspoken requests that, uh, that, are, that are dear to us, folks that are dear to us, and we want to take some time of silence to let each one uh, lift those requests up before your throne this morning. prayers. May your name be glorified in the worship that takes place here today. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 86 through 10. Lord, there is no one like you among the gods, and there are no works like yours. All the nations you have made will come and bow down before you, Lord, and will honor your name. For you are great and perform wonders, you alone are God. I invite you to stand as we sing out our praises to our amazing God.
This is the uh, second week in our series we've been titled Touched by Jesus. Last week we saw Jesus going into the synagogue and, and teaching there with, with, uh, with an authority that, that people had never heard before. Um, obviously, when we talked about it last week, uh, Jesus is the Word, so he can, he can explain the Word with an authority like nobody else could. And, and the people had never heard anything like that. Uh, they were amazed at his words. Um, and, and then they were even more amazed when within that service an evil spirit spoke to Jesus through a man who, who was present in the service. And Jesus rebuked that demon and that demon immediately left the man. And, and the people, once again, it says, were amazed and and were astonished at, at what had taken place. They had never seen anything happen like that in, in their service in the synagogue. Um, never seen somebody that had power over evil spirits as Jesus displayed on that day. And then uh, verse 28 of Mark 1 says, News about him spread quickly. And we can imagine that it did. It didn't take a 24-hour news channel to get the word out about the things that, that Jesus was doing and, and in, uh, in the service in, in the synagogue and, and even outside of that with, with the healings that, uh, that were taking place. And so today we're going we're gonna to stay in Mark chapter 1. We're going to look at, uh, at two short passages that tell us of, of two more people that were touched by Jesus, two different people who were touched by Jesus. These two are healed by his actual physical touch Whereas the man last week who was delivered from the evil spirit was, was healed uh, just by the words of Jesus that were directed at him or, or at, actually at this evil spirit that, that, uh, that indwelled this man. Um, those words of Jesus touched this man's life uh, after it seems like this, this evil spirit had inhabited this man for, for quite a length of time. Um, but we saw Jesus' power over that spirit just, just through words that came from his mouth. Um, and, and that power testifies to who Jesus is. That power testifies to Jesus as the Son of God. And those who witness that power then will will have to make a decision for themselves. And, and we've talked about this for the last couple of weeks. Those who witness that power must decide, is this truly the Son of God? Or is this just another imposter that has come along that was so common in, in those days and in those times, lots of people came along and declared themselves to be the Messiah? And you have to make a decision. Is this the true Messiah or is this not? And how do we tell them? By the fruit that comes forth. And so when these people saw Jesus deliver this man from the evil spirit, that's fruit that testified to who Jesus in fact was as the Son of God. And, and then they have to answer that question. Do I believe that this is indeed the Messiah. And that's the most important question that will ever be answered, and that has not changed even today for us. The most important question that we will ever answer is who is Jesus to me? Who is Jesus to me? That is the most important question that each one of us, each one, will answer for ourselves. And that question carries with it eternal consequences. Eternal consequences. It, it's, a, it's really a one-question test, right? We've all taken tests in school. We've taken tests at the DMV. We, you know, we take tests all the time. This is a one-question test. And we must get it right. And in these verses that we're going to look at today, again from Mark chapter 1, we'll see Jesus giving us more ammunition to be able to answer that question correctly. The first passage that we're going to look at is from Mark chapter 1, 
verses 29 through 31. A short passage, uh, three verses, uh, Mark 29, 31. Uh, it's important, I think, that, that we take a look at these verses. Verse 29. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. The, the they there they talk about is Jesus and his disciples. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went to, with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told Jesus about her. So he went to her, Jesus went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her. <coughs> And she began to wait on them. As we, as we noted last week, uh, many of these accounts of, of people that have been touched by Jesus that we read here in, in the book of Mark, these accounts can also be found in Matthew and also in Luke. Uh, we can read those accounts as well and maybe get a little bit clearer picture of everything that took place. Uh, but we hear, see here starting out in verse 29 where Jesus had left the synagogue. Where we saw him last week, where he delivered that man from an evil spirit. Jesus had left the synagogue and made the short trip to Simon and Andrew's home. Archaeologists have found the synagogue that was, that was in Capernaum. And they also believe that they have found Peter's house. And it was indeed a very short distance from the synagogue. Um, Simon and Andrew were brothers. Simon we know better as Peter, and Andrew was his brother. Um, Simon's mother-in-law talks about, so we know, we can figure out logically that, that Peter was married, right? Because he's talking about his mother-in-law, okay? She had been sick with a fever, evidently, for some time. And if we look at this same account in the book of Luke, Luke was a physician, right? Uh, we see it tells us in Luke 4.38 that this was a high fever. Luke is the one that tells us that. And we would expect that from a doctor, right? It, it would give us a few more details about it. Simon's mother-in-law has a high fever, so certainly this is a concern to Peter, who is her son-in-law. So what, is, what does Simon do for her? What does Simon Peter do for her? He brings the great physician to her side. He told Jesus of her condition, that she had was experiencing this, this high fever, and, and certainly as the Messiah, you know, he already knew that. He, he knew that, that Peter's mother-in-law had, had been struggling with a high fever. But, but Simon speaks to Jesus on behalf of his mother-in-law. And, and that's, a good, that's a good lesson for us. Good lesson for us to think about, that, that Jesus wants us to come to him with, with things that we are concerned about. He wants us to lift our loved ones up, loved ones who are struggling, maybe, maybe physically or emotionally or spiritually. He wants us to bring them to him. He wants us to lay our sorrows at his feet. He wants us to intercede for those that are that are struggling, that are that are fighting an illness or whatever whatever it might be, and, and this is just what we see Simon Peter doing here, right? He tells Jesus of his mother-in-law who is fighting this fever. He connects Jesus with the one that needs his healing touch. Great example, a great example for us, and, and that's just what Jesus provides for her is that healing touch. Verse 31 says, He went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. A couple of things that it's important for us to know here. First Mark tells us that he took her hand. He, he physically touched her and took her hand and helped her up out of bed. And, and that's important for us to understand because in those times, under Jewish law, if you touched a person that had a fever... It made you unclean. It made you unclean as well. Not only the person that had the fever was unclean, but you were unclean as well because you touched that person. And those around who saw him reach out to touch her, you know, they probably were like, well, what are you doing? You know, what, what's going to happen here? And they, they were probably mortified. But obviously, 
Jesus had no concern, right? He had no concerns. He knew that when he touched her, that she would be healed. He knew that his touch would make her whole again and bring her back to health. And, and that touch not only witnessed to her, the one who was struggling with his sickness, but that touch also witnessed to his disciples that had gathered around and, and, were, and were witnesses of this, that were in that home as well and, and got to see this all take place. Watching this, watching, watching Jesus touch her and heal her would, would only enhance the confidence that they already had that indeed this man was the son of God. And so that's, that's important for us to think about. We see that um, when Jesus reached out and touched her and, and, and helped her to her feet, took her hand and helped her to her feet, there was no time needed to regain strength. It wasn't like he healed her and then she had to, you know, take two or three days to get her strength back. Uh, no time was needed for recovery. And we know that because at the end of verse 31 it says the fever left her and she began to wait on him. Just that quick. The fever left her and she began to wait on him. She began to serve him. She probably started getting a meal together for them right away. And, and you know, in those days the meal did not involve a microwave and, you know, a frozen dinner or something like that. Uh, it was a significant undertaking to prepare a meal. And I know I know, I see some of you women smiling out here. Jesus healed her so that she could get up and make a meal. Right? Is that, I know that's what you're thinking. I know that. So that the guys didn't have to do it. But let's not, let's not try to undermine the significance of what happened. Yes, I'm sure that Jesus enjoyed the meal that was prepared. And I'm sure it was wonderful when the disciples all joined together and, and they were very thankful for this meal. This meal that was prepared by the woman that Jesus had just healed. But his intent, I'm certain, was to bring health and wholeness to one who was struggling. To bring healing back into the life of one that had been experiencing a high fever. To allow her to resume the duties that she normally would have been a part of on a daily basis. But let's think about it from the woman's point of view. I'm, I'm sure she felt like whatever it was that she could do for Jesus, it wasn't going to be enough. Because she had been in bed with a high fever. We don't know for how many days, but, but a high fever in, the, in those times was, was a pretty significant illness. And I'm sure, you know, some people never recovered. Jesus came in, touched her. She, she rose and went, went about her daily duties. And I'm sure that she felt like she could not say thank you enough to Jesus. He healed her, delivered her from a high fever, and she is ready to show her gratitude for what he has done for her. So let's think about, let's think about us for a minute. Is it really any different for us when Jesus touches our lives? What is, what is our response? What is our response when, when we feel the touch of Jesus in our lives? We should re be ready to serve him in whatever way we can, just, just like Peter's mother-in-law was. Ready to serve him. And, and again, not in some kind of effort to, to repay him, because that obviously would be impossible. What Jesus has done for us, we could never repay but we should be ready to show our great love for him and what it is that he has indeed accomplished within us. What he has accomplished in our lives. We have no way to deal with our own sin. But 
Jesus paid the price for each one of us. He cleansed us from, from that stain of sin that, that we are all born with. And he brought us into the kingdom of light when we really didn't deserve it. We really didn't deserve it. So we honor him. We honored him when we felt that touch of his. When we felt his cleansing power in our lives, we, we honor him by, by working for him, however that might look in, in your life. <clears throat> by witnessing of his mercy and grace. By being unashamed of, of being called a child of God. We honor him in those ways because of the way that he touched us and cleansed us. He delivered us from death. He delivered us from eternal destruction when he put his hand upon our life. And we can't ignore that, can we? We can't ignore that. So how do we say thank you? How do we say thank you? Hopefully, that desire to serve him in some way is, is burning brightly within each one of us. Um, Simon's mother-in-law was using her gift of hospitality to serve Jesus in that way, to show him her thanks because of what he did for her. So the question, just to wrap up just this first part of the message is, how are we using our gifts to serve Jesus? In these days that we're in. How are we using the gifts that we have been given through the Holy Spirit to serve Him? That's a question that I think we all need to honestly ask ourselves. What are we doing for Jesus? The second short passage that we're going to look at today again is from Mark chapter 1. And it's... Um, Three verses again from starting at verse 40, verses 40 through 42, Mark chapter 1. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Filled with compassion, Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him. And he was cured. Talking about, talking about leprosy here, leprosy is, is an awful disease. And, and really, I think about the only time we really hear about it is when we read scripture. Um, we, we probably in our minds think of it as a disease that affected people back in Bible times. Uh, there are still... Somewhere around 125,000 cases of leprosy diagnosed in our world today. So it's not just something that affected folks in Bible times. Obviously, now we have different ways to deal with it and, and uh, different ways to treat it um, that they didn't have back then. But leprosy is a disease that, and in this time, in the time of, of Jesus, um, it was a disease that it affected the skin and the nervous system, and it was horrible. Um, I'm going to spare you the details, but uh, if left untreated, ultimately it was dead. It was dead. If you contracted leprosy, it was a death sentence for you. Um, as I said, in Jesus' day, there, were, there was no treatment. Um, people were generally confined to, to communities of lepers. So as not to spread the disease, uh, if they were in public, they were required to shout "unclean, unclean" as they, you know, as they as they moved about, so that people could could avoid them. Um, custom at that time said you had to stay six feet from a leper. Sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? And I'm not going to go there. They were, lepers were supposed to tear their clothes so that, so that people could recognize them as a leper from a distance. 
because they were wearing raggedy clothes. One rabbi used to boast that he threw rocks at lepers so that they would avoid him. If you were a leper at that time, you were considered to be a walking dead person. A walking dead person. So we can see and understand a little better why this, why this leper that we read about here in, in Mark 1, why he seemed so desperate. Why he seemed so desperate. Verse 40 says that he came to Jesus and begged him on his knees. Fell before Jesus and begged him. And, and certainly this leper had, had heard of all those that Jesus had been healing around Capernaum during, during that time. And, and he believed in his heart that, that if, if, he could, if he could find Jesus, that he would be healed as well. He showed great faith, didn't he? He showed great faith in the ability that Jesus had to heal him. He says, if you are willing, the leper says, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus was willing. Jesus was willing. Verse 41 says, Jesus was filled with compassion. Filled with compassion. He looked at this poor man who had had the boldness, even in his even in his condition. You know, somebody that was supposed to stay far away from people. This man had the boldness to kneel at the feet of Jesus and to ask him to make him clean. And Jesus looked at him, scripture says, filled with compassion. Looked at him with sorrow at, at the suffering. That, that this man had endured. And, and then Jesus did something that was unthinkable to everyone that, that was gathered around. Unthinkable. He reached out and touched the leper. Physically touched the leper. And more than likely, more than likely this, this leper had not known the touch of another human being for maybe years. Maybe years. <coughs> and again, Luke, the, the physician in, in a parallel passage, said that, that this man was full of leprosy. It was not something that was in its early stages with him. Luke says he was full of leprosy, Luke 5.12. But yet Jesus reached out his hand and physically touched him. And, and I think about I think about our lives and, and being touched is by by another person is something that we take for granted at any time. You know, what do we do when, when we greet somebody back here in the foyer? We shake hands, don't we? Sometimes we give hugs. Sometimes we'll pat somebody on the back, in, in, you know, just just to say, you know, I love you, I, I appreciate you, I, you know, thank you for being my friend. It, it, you know, we do this, those things in a, a brotherly or a, or a sisterly kind of way, and, and it, it makes us feel good. It makes us feel good that, that somebody recognizes us enough to, to walk up and shake our hand. But think about a leper. They didn't have that. There was nobody that was going to walk up to a leper and shake their hand. No one was going to touch them for any reason. But Jesus did. Jesus did, and, and it says immediately, immediately the leprosy left him, and he was cured. Immediately the leper was made clean. And the one who had to, had to avoid everyone for so long could now walk freely and go among people and go wherever he wanted to go. He made sure that he told everyone how he had been healed. 
And who was responsible? Even though we read in, in later verses that Jesus told him not to tell anyone. And the reason Jesus told him that, his fear did, did come to pass. That, that so many people would search out Jesus that it would be impossible for him to move about freely and to minister as he, as he wanted to. And that's the reason he told this leper not to tell him. And as a result of this leper going out and telling everyone that he saw what Jesus did for him, as a result of that, Jesus had to stay outside the town in lonely places, we read in Mark 1, 45. And people still came to him from everywhere around. He couldn't hide. And in reality, if you think about it, the leper and Jesus had kind of switched places, right? Now, the clean man, the former leper, could walk around among people, be amongst crowds, you know, live his life just as normal. And now Jesus was the one who had to isolate himself out in lonely places. He was restricted now from where he could go, from where he could walk, and, and he couldn't be among the crowds anymore. and switch places. We can very easily look at leprosy as it is presented in Scripture and see it as a, as a parable of sin. Have you ever thought about that? This was a new idea to me that I heard this week. We look at leprosy as it's presented in Scripture. It is a parable of sin. Leprosy starts out making slow progress in, in, within a person, within, within their body. And sin many times works the same way. It can find its way into our lives and, and sometimes we hardly notice it or we think that, you know, think that we can deal with it. And so we don't pay much attention to it. Leprosy, after it makes its slow progress, Soon becomes a soon becomes a destructive force within us. It takes away our senses. It takes away our ability to feel anything. And sin, in the same way in our lives, if if it is left unchecked, can gain a foothold within our hearts. And, and then all we live for is the is the opportunity to to feed that sin, and, and, and it comes at the expense of our of our families and our jobs and ourselves. And then ultimately, leprosy brings about ruin to a person's life and, and takes away life itself. And sin acts in just the same way. Sin, if it is not dealt with in our lives, continues to beat us down to the place where we think that there is no hope for us. And we wonder if even the Lord Jesus could save us because of who we become and because of the sin that, that rages in our hearts. But we need to recall this, this interaction between Christ and the leper. Christ, filled with compassion, reached out and touched the leper. And once again, just as we saw with, the, with Peter's mother-in-law with the fever, if you touch someone with the fever, you were, made, you were declared unclean. It's the same way with the leper, obviously. Probably to a greater degree. But that didn't stop Jesus. Jesus reached out and touched the leper, again making himself unclean. He took that infirmity of the leper upon himself, and he made the man clean once again. When Jesus looks at us, when he looks at someone that's infected by sin, 
We, we who are, are truly the walking dead, he looks at us with that same compassion as he looked upon the leper. He says, I can make you clean. I can make you whole again. I took your sins to the cross and dealt with them there on your behalf. I can touch you. And you will be cleansed by the moving of my spirit. Come to me and experience the wonder of being touched by my hand, of being delivered from sin, of being healed, and of being restored once again. Only Jesus can bring about that miracle in your life and in my life. Only Jesus. And he is willing. Just as he is willing, just as he was willing to touch the one that had the fever. Just as he was willing to touch the man that had the leprosy. He is willing to touch your sin-stained life and to bring you to health and wholeness again in his presence. I hope that, that each one of us are ready to, to lay our sins before his throne, whatever that might be, and let God move in our lives with a cleansing power that only he can provide. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth that we find there. I thank you for your son, Jesus. For his willingness to touch those who were unclean. For his willingness to go to the cross and to take upon himself our sins that made him unclean. Thank you for your power that allowed him to deal with those sins. To wash them away and to make each one of us white as snow when we bring them before him, your throne. Father, we thank you for your love, for your grace, and for your mercy in each one of our lives. Lord, we don't get what we deserve. Just. 
Jesus Christ from the dead. God be with you till we meet. 